But uh, today we've got Dr. David Merker, and he has worked as a professional forester for 34 years, including 21 years in his current role as a unit extension program. He educates landowners, loggers, foresters, educators, youth, and society about sustainable forest management. Special interests include hardwood, silviculture, forest management, and timber markets. His background takes in 13 years in private consulting forestry in Indiana before joining UT in 1999. And uh, David has led countless education programs and field days in an effort to inform Tennessee's private landowners of responsible forest management. He also manages forest land at the West Tennessee Research and Education Center in Jackson, which is nationally recognized as a third party certified American tree farm. He was recognized as a fellow with the Society of American Foresters, has received the National Family Forest Education Award, and was chosen as the 2020 National Extension Forester of the Year. Uh, David is a prolific writer with innumerable publications. He received his BS and MS degrees in forest resource management from Southern Illinois University and complete, completed his PhD in natural resources resources from the University of Tennessee. He is a field forester at heart, but presently chooses to serve the forest and the greater society in an academic setting. He is married to Cheryl, and together they have two children and five grandchildren. His grandpa name, which I really love, is Woody. So I'm going to turn it over right now to David Merker. Thanks a lot, Lindley. I guess I'll go ahead and share this, uh, get it to work. It's good to see people, is it not? Just good to be around somebody. Is anybody else ready for precedented? We've heard so much about unprecedented. I'm ready to return to precedented and, and long for those days. Again, let's get this started here. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to begin just with one personal slide. I guess I'll call it my brag slide, but it is uh, it just gives you a little bit of, better idea of, of who I am and what, what motivates me. So I'll let you read that. That's what causes my feet to hit the ground every morning is that mission statement right, right there. Now, um, the subject we're going to be talking about today, dendrology, there's a number of ways that this could be taught. And oftentimes, if I'm just walking with a group around a park and identifying trees, I teach it using what I call the briefs. If you learn your briefs, then you can learn your trees uh, pretty easily. And essentially, briefs are brief recognizable features. And so I could flash this picture on, on the screen, and many of you probably can identify that. I think I saw somebody say tulip poplar already. That's right, tulip poplar or tulip tree. Sometimes it's called yellow poplar. And the brief recognizable feature for it is the fact that the leaf uh, and the flower both look like the tulip. So that's a brief recognizable feature. And most everybody in West Tennessee could certainly recognize this one, probably even more so than the tulip poplar. Yeah, the scourge of the South, right? That's the sweet gum tree. And of course we recognize it uh, not so much by the leaf, but, but the the balls that it has, those spiny balls that everybody learns to hate. And what about this tree right here? A little bit more of a challenge, but we've probably all seen this and certainly heard the name before. That's shag bark hickory. Of course, the brief for it is the fact that its bark um, flakes loose or becomes, it shakes loose, in other words, shag bark hickory. So those are three pretty easy briefs to learn, but, but what about these three? Hmm. A little bit more challenging. Actually, it, it's the exact same trees, the same three trees. You see the, 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 uh, the cone or the, the fruit mass of the yellow poplar there to your left. In the middle is the very corky bark of the sweet gum, and then the terminal bud of the shag bark hickory. And so we could go on and on with that. And in fact, if I were to flash this on here, somebody would say, oh, that's the American beech, right? That's the one that everybody carves their, their, their initials on or their I love Susie initials on, right? And so you might recognize it. The brief is that, that smooth bark to it. They're all, of course, not hollow like that one is. And you might guess the, uh, this species as well. The bark might throw you a little bit, but once you see 
the cone, you realize, well, that's, that's one of the southern yellow pines. Um, that's the loblolly pine. And we can even take it to this level, a little bit more challenging. Um, as I look at the, at the, the picture on the left there, uh, those uh, branches that have been retained lower like that remind me of the bald cypress. And you might recognize the fruit ball in the right picture. So those are the brief recognizable features. And we can even take it one more level. Hmm, that's a little bit more challenging because all you have is the bark. All you have is the bark and it looks fairly similar. We've got the pecan on the left and the black walnut on the right. And if I were standing at the base of that tree, the walnut on the right, I would take my, my, my pocket knife and I would score off the bark a little bit and you would see a Hershey's chocolate bar underneath. Very dark chocolate. And the pecan doesn't have that. And what about this one? That's got its own brief recognizable feature, right? Well, today we're not going to address uh, dendrology in this manner by talking about briefs. We're going to actually address it the way that they teach it in science class. So dendrology then is that field of botany that deals with the identification and the classification of woody plants, dendrology. What tree is that? And so essentially a series of uh, if then questions are asked using the dichotomous key and I'll show you the dichotomous key uh, at the end. I in fact, I think it's available in the material that Lindley might have sent you, but using a dichotomous key, a series of if then questions are asked of each tree sample that you're looking at, which carries the reader to the next series of questions. So it's kind of, you're headed down a rabbit trail, if you will. And the rabbit trail splits and it goes this way and it goes that way. And you continue to ask these if then questions so in a broad sense then, trees can be broken into two different groups, group A or group B. Now, with group A, leaves are needle-like. So that means they're called coniferous or they're conifers. In other words, they bear cones. You see the word cone in there. They're cone-bearing trees. Oftentimes they're called evergreens. People say, well, they, they never lose their, their leaves. Well, yes, they do. If you've ever walked underneath a pine tree, you, there's plenty of leaves on the ground, right? But in a sense, they retain their leaves for a year or two or two or three years until such point that those, those needles or those leaves are no longer useful, and then they shed them. The forest industry refers to these as softwood trees. Uh, although their wood isn't always softer than hardwoods, it generally is. And so we know conifers as the trees that are used to, to make paper and construction lumber and things like that. So the green leaves are present during the winter. Um, they have either needles or scales. And they have a longer photosynthetic period, meaning that they can photosynthesize even in the winter months if you get these warm 70 degree days. Uh, and that gives them an advantage over the other species, the other group that we're going to be talking about. So as I said, the needles can be either scale-like, such as the cedar tree, that's the most, eastern red cedar is the most widely dispersed tree in all of eastern North America. So the cedar trees that you see along the fence rows and under power lines and maybe even your backyard, they might have originated from a tree that was, from a bird that was migrating and picked up a seed in Paducah, Kentucky and then defecated in your yard. That's how they get dispersed. The seed won't germinate unless it passes through the intestine of an animal. Uh, needles can also, also be born singly. So you can see individual needles in this case, born singly, but other times they're born in bundles or clusters. And you might see bundles of two or three or five or, 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 or different. So then regarding the conifers, again, we're still in group A. If the leaves are scale-like, that would be one of the cedars. If they are needle-like, then we break it down into single needles, which would be the spruce or fir or hemlock. Not very common uh, in West Tennessee. All those species typically like higher elevations. If the needles are in bundles of two, that would be what we call the uh, Virginia pine or the Scotch pine. I refer to them as our Christmas trees because that's typically the species that we'll use uh, for Christmas trees in our region. If the needles are in bundles of two and three on the same tree, this is shortleaf pine, also known as the old field pine. So as the Industrial Revolution uh, moved its way into Tennessee in the earlier part of last century, a number of old fields were abandoned. Just people moved out of rural areas into urban areas to find work. And many of those old fields regenerated back or they grew back to shortleaf pine, hence the name 
old field pine. If the needles are in bundles of three, that would be the ones that we see grown in straight rows as you drive along the interstate. This is your loblolly pine. And uh, every time you order something from Amazon, you can thank a loblolly pine because the boxes most likely came from this species. And then if the needles are in bundles of five, that at least in Tennessee is the white pine. That's a species that's not very uh, common at all in West Tennessee. In fact, it doesn't do very well in our hot, dry climates. But as you migrate east uh, in the state, higher elevations, you'll see plenty of white pine. So um, let's turn to group B, because this is mostly what our state is. I I've addressed pine briefly. But contrary to what people think, pine are not taking over the world. Um, roughly 11% of our, our state is covered with pine trees, and that's less than what we had in 1950. So we we're actually losing pine acreage, believe it or not. Group B are those leaves that are non-needle-like. So we refer to those in the scientific realm as the deciduous trees, meaning they, they lose their leaves in the fall of the year. Sometimes they're just called broad leaves. Uh, and then the wood industry refers to them as the hardwoods. And so we know that oaks and hickories and maple and ash and so forth, um, their wood is pretty hard, hence the name, uh, the nickname, hardwoods. Now the green leaves are absent in the winter. They are uh, responsible for providing most of the fall color that we have that we're fixing to enjoy here in a, in a few short months. And, and as I said, roughly 89% of our forests in the state are of this timber type, the hardwoods or the the deciduous type trees. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's, let's head down this rabbit trail. We're gonna begin our dichotomous key, if you will. And I'm gonna talk about a number of features of leaves that will help you um, through the process of elimination in identifying your tree. And one of the first things we ask is, as we approach a tree is what is the leaf arrangement? And what I mean by that is the leaf arranged in such a way that uh, it is alternating on the stem or it's opposite, opposite on the stem. So here we have the, the leaf blade itself. Now the stalk of a leaf is called a petiole, P-E-T-I-O-L-E, -E. that's the petiole. The point where the leaf attaches to the stem is the node, N-O-D-E. And as the growing season progresses, um, the leaf will form a, a bud just above that node every year. This bud then actually becomes a branch next year from which leaves emerge. So you'll notice here that these nodes are alternating back and forth on the stem. But sometimes those nodes where these petioles attach are opposite each other. And not very many species have opposite branching. And I always use the acronym mad buck in a box mad buck in a box. That refers to maple, ash, dogwood, buckeye, and box elder. That's the five general species in our region that have opposite branching, mad buck in a box. So that's the first characteristics we, we look at. Let's take this one step further. Let's look at the leaf form. And what I mean by that is the leaf simple in other words, we have a singular leaf with one petiole attached to the twig. That's what I just showed you. A singular leaf, one petiole attached to the twig, or is the leaf compound? And what I mean by that is we have several smaller leaflets, each attached to the petiole, which in turn then is attached to the twig. So let me show you what I mean. Simple leaf is relatively simple. So here we have two leaves, right? We know that is the American sycamore. There's the leaf. This is the, if this were interactive, I'd ask you to tell me what that is. So you just mouth it right now. What do we call that part? Petio, right? So we have two leaves in this picture. There's the leaf, there's the petio, there's the node. That's a simple leaf, very common. Now, trick question. How many leaves are in this picture? Mmm, one, that's right. There's only one leaf in this picture. That's a compound leaf. Each one of these are actually called a leaflet. So collectively, this is the leaf, and we have leaflets attached to the leaf. Notice they don't have a petiole, or not much of one. There's no stalk there. It's attached directly to, actually this section from, from here to here is called a petiole. In compound leaves, this section from here to here is called a 
rachis, R-A-C-H-I-S. So there's one leaf uh, in this picture. Quite often over the, over the course of my career, of course, uh, youth uh, children have leaf collecting projects that they have to do at school. Usually what happens is Johnny is on the soccer field and his mom brings his leaves to me <laughs> to help identify. Uh, so I end up teaching her instead of Johnny. But invariably, she will pull out of her bag or he will pull out of his bag one of these and say, what leaf is this tree from? And I say, well, you don't have a leaf. What you have is a leaflet. This is a leaflet. So be careful about that. Compound leaves. Moving on then, we can talk about the shape of the leaf. And basically what I'm referring to here is um, uh, on, on the, the margin of the leaf, is there lobes or is it entire? So you understand what a lobe is, that's that portion that sticks out right there. White oak oftentimes have, have deep lobes, but other species like the southern magnolia is lobeless, okay? So lobed or entire, that's relatively simple. Carrying our dichotomous key one step further then, we can look at the margins of the leaf. Specifically, we're trying to determine, are the margins of the leaf serrated? In other words, do they have fine teeth or are they smooth? And sometimes these serrations can be very coarse like a cross cut saw. Other times they're really fine like a hacksaw blade. So the cottonwood has coarse serrations, but the poplar tree doesn't have any serrations. Now, we've talked about three or four different characteristics. Can you see how we, we can begin bringing those characteristics together? So for instance, we've already determined this is serrated, but is it lobed or entire? It's entire, right? We don't have any lobes here. Just the opposite with this, this is a smooth margin, but it is lobed. It is lobed, so serration, lobed, in this case, this would be alternating branching. You can't see that on the cottonwood, but it would be alternating too. Can you see how we're melding these characteristics together? All right, um, the sinus um, is the gap between the lobes. And so, so I, a lot of times when I'm working with youth, I, think, I tell them, well, think of your ear lobes as being the part that kind of sticks out. Thinking your sinus is, is the part that kind of goes in. and so. In that case right here, here's the lobe, but this section in between the lobe is the sinus, right? Now, a group of trees that are, are very hard to identify, even amongst professional foresters, are the red oaks. And oftentimes to help differentiate between the red oaks, we look at the depth of the sinuses. So for instance, in the scarlet red oak, the sinus is very deep and C-shaped. Can you see that? Whereas the northern red oak uh, is very shallow and kind of U-shaped. See the difference there? It's very subtle. Of course, we could look at the acorns and the bark too that would help us. But um, the sinus in is the gap between the two lobes. How about the leaf base? The leaf base symmetry. Essentially what we're looking at is if you were to take this leaf right here and fold it in half, you can see how the base of that leaf pretty much would be symmetrical. In contrast though, if we were to fold the uh, basswood tree in half, you can see that one side, the leaf in half, you can see that one side would dip down below the other. So the leaves look fairly similar, but this one's serrated, this one's smooth. They're both without lobes, so they are entire, but the base symmetry is different. Another species that has an asymmetrical base would be the elm trees. Elms have a slight uh, difference in, in the, the symmetry of, uh, of their base. Leaf base symmetry. We can also look at the bristle tips or the absence of bristle tips on the ends of the lobe. So within the state of Tennessee, we have, we actually have 20 different oak species that are native. And most people just thought, well, there's a red oak and there's a white oak. No, there's, there's actually 20 different oaks that are native to the state. 12 of them are in the red oak group and eight of them are in the white oak group. And within each of them, if you wanted to break them down, half of each of them are bottomland oaks and the other half are upland oaks. And what I mean by that, bottomland is what you have over there 
as you get closer to the river and Mississippi area, lowland, upland, of course, is what most of the state has. Now, one of the characteristics, the differentiating characteristics between these two groups is that the red oak group will have these bristle tips on the ends of their lobes. Think of them as like a long whisker, in other words. White oak doesn't have that. Can you see how the end of the lobe is rounded there? There are some exceptions to this rule, as there normally are. Some of the red oaks, uh, particularly if the leaves are juvenile, young leaves, will be missing the bristle tips. So you have to look the tree over carefully, particularly some of the higher up leaves, the leaves higher on the crown of the tree. So lobes with bristle tips or lobes that are smooth. I mentioned the leaf base uh, already. You can see another example would be a flattened leaf base. We can talk about it being obtuse or sharply wedge shaped. There's a lot of things we, can, we could get into if we wanted to. And even this, this is a distinguishing characteristic that helps me out a lot. Sometimes leaves will have a noticeable pubescence, typically on the underside of the leaf, but quite often on the petiole too and sometimes on, on the leaf surface on the front side too. But these are fine, very short hairs. And in some cases, these hairs, you can actually rub on them with your hand and they'll come off in your hand. You can see them. Um, American sycamore and black oak are examples where that happens. Well, the opposite, opposite then of pubescence would be glabrous. That would be leaves, which is most of them, that are smooth, in other words, without real noticeable hairs. So let me give you an example. We're gonna start bringing these characteristics together. This is group B. Um, and if you want to unmute yourself, uh, that would be great at this time. And that way you can kind of participate and I'll try not to humiliate anybody if they get it wrong, don't worry about that. So example one of this leaf that we're looking at right here, the question is, are the leaves needle-like or non-needle-like? Well, that's pretty easy question to answer. They're non-needle-like, right? So, so far, so good. Are the leaves opposite or alternate in arrangement? Remember the first characteristics we talked about. Anybody want to guess? That's alternate. That's right. Alternate. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, don't get confused with the seed pods here. Look at the leaves themselves. There's the leaf. There's what we call the what? Yeah. Petiole, that's right. And notice the petioles alternate back and forth. Now, something you have to be careful of, as the growing season advances, the distance between these nodes gets closer and closer together. And so toward the end of the branch, it looks like they're actually opposite, but they're not, they're just really close together. So come on back down the, the branch a, a little bit to where you can really notice the, the, the arrangement. Is the leaf simple or compound? It's simple. That's right. There's five different leaves there. One, two, three, four, five. Each one has their own petiole. And then is it lobed or entire? Entire. It's, it's entire. Don't confuse the base. Some people might want to call that a lobe, but it's not. The leaf itself is entire. And then is it serrated or smooth? It's smooth. smooth. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see sometimes here, but that's really supposed to be a, a smooth edge. You would recognize that as the eastern redbud tree, mm -hmm. a tree in, in, in West Tennessee. For example then, okay, we can see that these uh, leaves are non-needle-like. Look very closely, you'll see that it is alternating here. That's not opposite, so it's an alternate arrangement. Um, the leaf itself, simple, simple or compound? Simple. Simple leaves, that right, that's right. And clearly they are lobed, right? Yeah. Now, yes. you have to be careful with this next question. Are they serrated or smooth? smooth. Don't look at the bristle tips. They're smooth. That's right, look at that margin right there. The margin is clearly smooth. A lot of people want to call that serrated because they get confused with this. That's the next question, with or without bristle tips. And they do have bristle tips. So. This is the pin oak, Quercus palustris. Um, it's not a tree actually that we recommend in yard settings anymore because of the bacterial leaf scorch. We'll get it at about age 20 or 30 and it will die. And so we don't recommend it, but it is a, a favorite 
grown in, in the wild, in, in particularly in bottomlands, because the acorn's very small and a waterfowl love to eat those acorns for the carbohydrate reserves um, every winter. So um, here's the dichotomous key. I've mentioned a time or two. Now this is just one that I made up. So 21 years ago, when I came to, to the University of Tennessee, I knew right away I needed a couple things. I needed a collection of leaves, pressed leaves, uh, and I needed a key like this. And so I just made my own key up. A lot of times if you pick up a tree identification book, it will have its own key. Um, one of the things I teach every year is the teacher's conservation workshop. It's a four day long workshop that's free at Pickwick Landing. And we take the teachers to the woods and to the sawmills and to the creeks and they learn how to press leaves. And this is something that always interests them, those that actually teach science, is this dichotomous key and working with children to collect the leaves and have them make their own key. And you can make a key with as few as, you know, five leaves as you want to. But here's an example of a leaf key. And as Lindley said, I, I believe you have a copy of this to have access to a copy of this very key. Um, now, what I want you to notice is that you clearly see numbers there and you might recognize that the numbers are in pairs. And so for instance, we have two number ones. We have a pair of number ones. And each number one asks a question. Is the sample that you're holding in your hand, is the leaf compound or is the leaf a simple leaf? Well, you already understand how to, how to determine that because we went through it. But what you'll notice then is that depending on how you answer this question, sends you on two different rabbit trails. If the leaf was compound, you now have a very short rabbit trail. You're gonna find your species pretty quick. If the leaf was simple, then you're gonna be down here on this key and you're gonna be spending some time trying to figure out what it is. So let's say you ask the question, is it compound or is it simple? And your answer was, well, it's, it's compound. So that then is going to lead you to this set of questions, the number twos. You with me? Okay, so that means you're gonna ask the next set of questions, which is, is the leaf opposite or is it alternating? If it's opposite, then you're gonna stay up here and you've only got one more question to answer and you're gonna have your tree, uh, at least if it's one of these that, that are on the list anyway. But if your leaf was simple, now you're down on this really long rabbit trail. And you ask the question again, is it opposite or is it alternating leaf? And let's say that you determine that it is opposite, that's gonna send you to this pair of questions. And then you're gonna find your answer pretty quickly. Is it entire lobed? If it's lobed, you're gonna come down here depending on how many lobes then, it takes you to the next question. And pretty soon, through a process of elimination, scientifically, you've discovered what species of tree that you miraculously held in your hand that just a few minutes ago, you didn't know what it was. So um, I'm gonna pause a question, or pause, pause a moment. In fact, I think before asking questions, I wanna show you some leaf samples that I just picked this morning. And we're gonna go back at this time and we're gonna be talking about brief recognizable features. So I guess I need to stop sharing the screen. I don't know exactly how to do this to make me, how do you make me big? Everyone can go to the top of um, their screen and then you can click on speaker view and then you're big. Okay, <laughs> I like being big. Actually, I'm only four foot six, so I can brag about it. Okay, can you see this? Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about the brief recognizable features. We're gonna learn these by briefs very briefly. So there's no dichotomous key here. And the brief recognizable feature for this leaf is the fact that it is star-shaped. And you recognize it from the, the, the spiny balls that I showed earlier. This is the sweet gum tree. And usually whenever I teach this to youth, it's not enough for me just to say, okay, this is a sweet gum. I like to share with you. And when this tree is harvested, it is useful as what type of product. And sweet gum makes an excellent railroad tie. 
So it's very good for railroad tide. Now let me just say something that maybe I should have said from the onset. Um, Linda rec recognized me or introduced me as a forester. That's right, that's what I am, a professional forester. So wood industry is very important to me. And I like to say that I love trees so much so that I think we should be cutting more of them down. Now, usually that causes people to gasp a little bit when I say that and I lose their trust and then I have to try to regain it. But I truly mean that. Trees are renewable. They're biodegradable. The energy to produce trees is free. It's from the sun. They are green products. We can grow them and harvest them and grow more and harvest more. And as long as we're doing it in a sustainable manner, which we are in the United States, we've got nothing to worry about. I like to say we should be running to this resource, not running from it, because it's the answer to so many of our natural resource problems. They're renewable. For the last word in that, stop mowing your lawn. And watch how it grows back to a forest, right? It will do so. I've seen trees growing out of gutters and out of the, the 17th story of an abandoned building. They're going to grow back. So at any rate, sweet gum, you've got the brief recognizable feature. It makes a great railroad tie. Okay, it's hard to see maybe in this picture, but this is an opposite branched. Can you see that these branching are opposite? It's a compound leaf. So this entire thing is a leaf. If it's opposite and compound in our region, that's one of the ash trees. Um, ash is, is a, Splendid tree. It's the tree of firewood of kings. Kings loved ash trees. Makes a fantastic baseball bat, as you know. It's also a substitute for oak. Beautiful wood. The problem is, unfortunately, emerald ash borer, an exotic invasive pest, has moved into the United States, complements of Asia, and uh, it's killing the ash trees, uh, and there's no stopping it. And it's not on our side of the river yet. But East Tennessee has it. If you've traveled up through the Midwest over the past two years along the interstate, you will see millions of dead ash trees along the interstate. So it's a sad situation. Um, we're probably we're going to lose that tree, most likely. You might recognize um, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he? What kind of tree did he climb up into? A sycamore tree, right? To see what he could see. This is a very large leaf. Um, it's, you're not gonna be able to see it here probably. Yeah, you might. It has pubescence underneath, fuzziness. And when I scrape it with my fingers, you'll see it actually comes loose. It's flaking off on my table right now. American sycamore tree. It gets uh, sycamore anthracnose every spring and will lose its leaves, but it comes back. Surely you can recognize the state tree of Tennessee. That's the tulip poplar. Um, the tulip poplar uh, is primarily used in, in, construct in lumber as quarter round and trim, and they do veneer it for the inside panels of cabinets. So it's a very reliable tree, grows very fast. It's not a very attractive wood, so it's not worth much, but it regenerates or comes back very quickly. In fact, there's no shortage of poplar trees. When we harvest timber, this species wants to come back. The seeds can stay viable in the soil for up to seven years. So may, thousands of seeds are produced from each tree each year, and you multiply that by seven, and as soon as they get a splash of sunlight, when we harvest some timber in the woods, bam, they wanna come back right now. They grow so fast. I've mentioned uh, the white oak. Uh, it's a very stately tree. Uh, of course, it makes beautiful lumber. Uh, it's been very hot lately, actually, because the Asians have discovered uh, American bourbon and uh, the bourbon barrels are made from white oak. And so the, the value of white oak has gone through the roof uh, over the course of the last 10 years or so. Um, but it's a beautiful, stately, long-lived, hardy, um, storm-withstanding tree, slow growing, but um, there is concern actually that we are losing this species and primarily because it is not shade tolerant. And so, um, it doesn't come back easily in the forest unless we really disturb the forest in a major way. If we do a lot of selective cutting, that tends to favor shade tolerant trees. White oak is not one of those shade tolerance. It needs disturbances to, uh, to regenerate well. And that's contrasted with the, the red oak. This is one of the red oaks. It's a, this is actually the uh, cherry bark red oak. And the, it's Quercus pagoda. And the, the way it gets its name, maybe it's hard to see, but 
The bottom set of lobes looks like a Japanese pagoda hat. Can you see that? Pagoda, Quercus pagodafolia. Red oak is very common with furniture. Um, my table I'm coming to you from is, is made from red oak. So beautiful wood. Of course, you might recognize the sugar maple. Now, the way I teach the brief recognizable feature for it is that it has five lobes. Can you see them? One, two, three, four, five lobes. And with children, sugar has five letters, S-U-G-A-R, for sugar maple. Red maple, in contrast, has three lobes and three letters, R-E-D. So it's a quick way to teach it to children, sugar maple and red maple. You have a few of these uh, over in, in your neck of the woods. This is a bald cypress. Um, a lot of people think that the bald cypress like standing water. No, they don't like standing water. They just learn to adapt to grow in standing water. They prefer to have uh, soil that's not standing in water. Um, hardy tree, uh, very tolerable. I've, I've got it growing in my yard long, long way away from water. So it can grow on drier sites as well. Um, of course, you know it, it's used quite a bit for uh, uh, wood that must withstand um, water. In other words, uh, greenhouses and decking, siding and things like that. Bald cypress. This is a trick. In fact, it's not a tree at all. This is kudzu. <laughs> Had to throw that one in there. Um, the very large leaf of the black walnut tree. Juglans nigra, this is one leaf, the entire leaf, has a very pungent odor to it. And of course, the, the fruit of it as well that you recognize has a pungent odor too. Not a good choice of tree, typically in landscape settings because it produces a chemical called juglone and it makes uh, uh, it very difficult for plants to grow up underneath it, flowers and so forth. There are some that are tolerant, uh, but of course we know the value of walnut, it's a beautiful wood particularly for uh, fine wood products uh, and, uh, and the like. So um, that's about it. I've got, uh, I mentioned the pine and you can maybe see there that the needles are in clusters of three. That's an example of your loblolly pine. And this is the cone. Uh, loblolly pine is one of the uh, 10 types of Southern yellow pine. So it's one of the Southern yellow pine it's the one they've done a lot of genetic improvement on that can grow it so fast. Uh, but a characteristic of all these southern yellow pines, you might see the spine right there on the cones. They have spiny cones, uh, makes it hard to grab. And, uh, and then finally, I've got one last one. It's not the leaf at all. You might recognize that. Did I hear or see somebody mouth persimmon? <laughs> That's right. Does anybody care to eat it at this point? No, that's right. Um, it, you don't want to eat a persimmon unless you shake the tree and it falls off in your hand. That's when it's safe to eat. So, but um, favorite food for a lot of wildlife rely on this, and that's how it gets dispersed by being eaten and and, uh, and defecation. So, all right, I think I'm down to a, a couple minutes, Lindley, and um, I might be able to answer a question or two. But again, I'm a forester. I'm not an arborist, and so my real expertise and passion is forest land management, not yard trees. So this jaundiced look might come over my face if you ask a question that I'm not comfortable with, and those sometimes come, so. Um, well, thank you very much, David. That was great. Um, so I forgot to mention in the very beginning that, yes, David did have a handout. I sent it to some of you who had pre-registered. But um, right now it is, it should be on our website in the event calendar associated with um, the Munch and Learn, which will go away tomorrow. And so I will make sure that um, our social media queen, Kristen Rambo, um, puts it somewhere where it can be found. But um, I was curious, you said that Tennessee has lost pine acreage since the 1950s. Why is that? Is it because of things that people are doing, or is it because of nature and what it's doing? No, um, it's because you, you might remember I mentioned shortleaf pine, I call it the old field pine. Those pine trees have actually gone through their life cycle now. They came in during the Industrial Revolution, they have grown up and have either died or been harvested, and those stands have converted over to hardwoods. So we've lost the shortleaf pine, 
while we've gained the loblolly pine. So overall, it's been kind of a no-nat loss type thing, or you actually lose a little bit. There's actually an effort to try to bring shortleaf pine back because, uh, you know, we're not abandoning old fields anymore. <laughs> um, well, speaking of loblolly, tell me if this is true or not. Um, I used to work at Elmwood, and I worked with the Arboretum a little bit, um, although I'm not an arborist at all. And um, someone mentioned at some point, I don't even remember who it was, that in the 1930s, a lot of loblolly pines were planted. Do you know if that's true? Yeah, it's, it's probably more so, more so the 50s. Uh, during the soil bank days, 1950s and 60s, a lot of uh, our state forest land was just eroding away and they were planted back to loblolly pine and they've, they've done their job. They've restored the sites and now we have hardwood. See, in the end, pine must give way to hardwood in a natural setting because pine aren't tolerant to shade. So they grow up while other trees are growing up underneath them. Eventually they die or are harvested and that releases these trees. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of lo old loblolly pine on our state, state parks. We see it in golf courses and places like that too. I mean, they're fairly common, but uh, they do their job, they serve their purpose and, uh, and then allow something else to grow in its place. Well, Danielle, who is uh, one of our art to grow instructors, she wants to know how are you able to tell a leaflet versus a leaf once it has been removed from the tree? Okay, here's a compound leaf. Um, you notice when I break this leaflet off, there's no petiole there. Can you see that? There's no stalk. Whereas, you know, most trees, of course, are going to have this petiole, this stalk down there. This one doesn't have it. So that, that's typically how I see it. Sometimes they'll have a short stalk to them, but it can be challenging at times. But uh, Generally, you, you realize what's happened here when you don't see a petiole on the base of the leaf. Oh, that's a leaflet. <laughs> and um, Jim and Ann want to know how to prevent hemlock scale disease. Uh, well, and you might be, you're not thinking of hemlock well, woolly adelgid, are, are, are you? Um, uh, scale diseases typically can be killed with a, an insecticide called imidacloprid. Uh, that's poured around the base of the tree and, and insects that suck on the, the fluids out of the leaf, get the carbohydrates and sugar out of the leaf, end up dying. And the scale is actually an insect. It's just got a shield over it. Um, and so um, to be honest with you, you probably should talk to your county extension agent on, on that. That's getting into a realm that's a little bit uh, not forestry, more landscape related. But uh, I know dormant oil uh, can kill scales. It essentially smothers them is what it does. Um, so not a complete answer, but. Um, so um, let's talk about the insects that you brought up. Uh, once, um, you know, like by an invasive insect, um, do you think that, you know, after that, that insect won't have any food anymore, so it will die, and then, you know, several decades after that, the trees can be reintroduced? Okay, you were cutting out for some reason while you're talking, but I think I got the gist of your question. It, it, the question is, on the emerald ash borer, if they kill the ash trees, will ash trees come back? Um, there's actually a wasp that's a, a, a pest or a predator of the insect from its natural range. And they brought the wasp over here to attack the emerald ash beetle. The problem is in our climate, they don't emerge at the same time. So they would, you know, one will emerge early and the other emerges late and can't feed on it. So, that, so the wasp ends up dying. Now they think in cooler climates, they can get it so they can emerge at the same time. Uh, and so we might have ash back uh, uh, in northern, northern climates of the United States. Now let me take that back too. I think we'll always have some ash trees because what will happen is just like we still have elm trees, but yet we've had Dutch elm disease for a long time. The trees live long enough to produce seed. The seed are dispersed and they germinate and grow. Meantime, the parent tree then dies and the young tree grows up until it gets attacked. 
but it's already produced some seed too. So in other words, I think we'll continue to have ash, but they just won't be mature ash. They'll, they'll be smaller nature. And that's what we find with most of the elm trees too. So um, I don't know, in, in time, there might be some, you know, a species might adapt and then have offspring and, and eventually, you know, that's beyond the career of one forester to, to find that out. It takes decades, centuries you know, for that to happen, so. Okay, well, that is all of the questions that people have typed in. Um, if anyone has any last questions, you can unmute yourself and you can ask it if you'd like. Yeah, that's, I've got a question, this is Keith. Um, the hickories, are, do we only have two native hickories? In no. Actually, we have 10. Uh, I wrote a publication on this. You can Google it. Identifying hickory trees native to Tennessee. I think that's what it's called. You'd be surprised. There, there's actually 10 hickories and four of them have scaly bark. And so there's shag bark and pig nut and bitter nut and water hickory and southern shag bark, mocker nut. Uh, there's a bunch of hickories. Um, so, uh, but the wood industry typically throws them into two groups. And that's the hard hickories and the soft hickories. The hard hickories are difficult to machine and, and to cut, uh, but they make great tools. But a softer hickory is, is better for cabinets and if you want to have hickory flooring or something. That, an example would be a bitter nut hickory is a soft hickory. Mocker nut is a soft hickory. Uh, they're still hard, but it's softer than the others. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess I would like to maybe end with, with this. Um, for those of you that have interest, during this COVID-19 situation, we were all sent home and we were asked, we were told to work from home and it's kind of hard to be a traveling educator when you're at home. And so I was trying to figure out how am I going to reach private landowners during this period. One day scratching my head, I walked out on the back porch and I just thought, that's it back porch. So I began a series called Back Porch Forestry um, and I'm releasing YouTubes onto YouTube, a one per month. Most of them are related more to forest management, but I do have some presentations on there. In fact, the one you saw today is on there, um, more for the homeowner type thing. And so if you were to go to um, YouTube and just type in three words, Back Porch Forestry, you will find these and then you can become a subscriber and you'll know each time I release one. I release one per month. So um, if you're really into this, you might want to check out Back Porch Forestry. They're what I call 3030s. For anybody that hunts in here, you'll know what that means. But that's basically 30 slides in 30 minutes is, is what they are. Well, very good. Thank you so much, David. I learn some great basic things about trees today that I didn't really know before. So um, thank you all and come back next week. Our curatorial assistant, Katie Kaiser, will be doing a talk. And um, <clears throat> so you can email me <clears throat> or you can go to our website to get the link. So great seeing everybody. Thank you. And thank you, David. That was great. Goodbye.